Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. We are ready to uh, get started. Uh, my name is Christine Delaney, and I'm the <laughs> Director of Technical Services here at American University Library. And I'd like to welcome all of you to our the first session of our annual colloquy, colloquium on scholarly communication. And our topic this morning is the carpentries, teaching data science skills. We at American University Library have seen how academic research increasingly requires knowledge and skills concerning the collection, use, and, manip and manipulation of data. In the library, we believe that librarians have a role to play within the life cycle of data-driven research. But we've been challenged by the need to develop skills around data-driven research, particularly as it pertains to coding, analyzing, and managing data. Consequently, we've become very interested in the work of the Carpentries and the community which has been built to meet this need. Our speaker this morning is Christopher Erdman, who currently serves as the Library Carpentry Community and Development Director at the Carpentries and the California Digital Library. Chris has worked in libraries for more than 21 years to integrate data management and workflows in database and library systems. Through training, consulting, and tool development to build programs, he has tried to empower people in research and library communities to work effectively with data. Please join me in welcoming Chris Erdman. And, and thanks to all of you for the invitation to come and uh, talk mm -hmm. to you about this. Um, so I don't. I don't need to say too much about myself, um, um, but one, one thing I can, I can point out is um, in, my, in, in previous years I've worked uh, uh, with astronomers for about 10 years. I worked as a librarian embedded in astronomy and I, th I feel like those years were invaluable for learning how to work with data and uh, it was a community that was knee deep in data. <laughs> and so um, getting that experience early on um, it, 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 you know, I, I, with the astronomy community, you could see that, that data and software was invaluable to their research. It was becoming more prevalent um, in all the things that they do. Um, but we've seen that um, really emerge in um, so many other places these days. Uh, and um, nowadays, you can see it, see it across the spectrum of all the disciplines. Uh, um, and there's this real need to, to learn these skills. Um, to start, um, just to go through some, some reports that I found um, that uh, highlight the, the importance of this. Uh, so the NSF had this um, working group on, on uh, realizing the potential of data science. And uh, some of the things they highlight in this are um, trying to work across disciplines. So some of the disciplines um, have um, a, a good deal of experience working with data in, in this way um, for, for many years, and others are starting to um, think about how they can use data science, um, um, you know, machine learning and, and the way that they, they, uh, they do things. Um, and so um, parts of this report were trying to understand how you can connect these communities, how you can bring them together, um, how you can bring these skills from one community to the other. Um, and uh, the other part was to, one of the other highlights was to, um, to understand how in um, particularly academic institutions, how um, you could integrate um, data science into the curriculum, into um, educational opportunities. Uh, and one of the examples in that report is um, this Moore Sloan Data Science Environments uh, grant. Uh, was involved um, multiple institutions, including University of Washington, Berkeley, New NYU. Um, they, there may be another one that I'm missing in there, but uh, um, it was a consortium of universities uh, that was thinking about how they could support data science at their institution, how they could do what they were talking about in this report of bringing uh, these different disciplines together. And I think one of the interesting parts about that was um, that people needed a space, and the library ended up being one of the things that they highlighted as a place where people could come and, and, uh, and talk about how they could work on data science projects together. And uh, the other aspect of that, too, is li librarians as facilitators and bringing people together. And uh, so uh, that was a great um, report for highlighting the importance of, uh, of libraries. Um, the other thing, too, this report, um, although titled Open Science, they talk about how data, or, or open science, they, they talk about data science um, being important across the research life cycle. 
So data science enabling open science, uh, open research, so that researchers uh, in that process of learning these new skills and learning new approaches, making their re research more accessible um, to, to the public, to, you know, to um, the wider research community. Um, this one was surprising, um, investing in America's data science and analytics talent. Uh, this was a report, um, well, it was actually a report from a, a meeting of um, people from industry, leaders from industry and leaders from um, academic institutions um, thinking about data science um, at, at, you know, in academia and, 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 and later, you know, the potential for graduates uh, when they leave academia. And it was just surprising to see the gap, <laughs> the, the gap in business leaders needing these skills and academic institutions being a little bit flat-footed and not being prepared um, to, to handle the, you know, to, to be, be able to respond to that need. Um, the other thing that was mentioned in this report is very important too, is they, they highlighted the importance of, uh, importance of diversity, um, that um, they're not getting in business, they're not getting candidates that, you know, provide a diverse culture. Um, and so that was one of the needs that they, they highlighted. <coughs> and also, <laughs> We have data to support this. <laughs> LinkedIn did a study uh, to um, just recently um, of just demonstrating again this gap of um, industry needing all these data scientists, um, or sometimes thinking they need it. <laughs> but but I, um, but there is a huge need uh, for uh, for data science, and uh, you know the job market. There's there's uh, a lot of these unfilled positions. Um, Sorry, I've stalled. <laughs> there we go. Um, and uh, so it's not to say that academic institutions have been completely flat-footed flat and uh, there have been a lot of um, data science initiatives that um, have popped up and you, I'm sure you recognize a lot of these names. Um, at least in two places, I, I was involved with two data science initiatives when I was at Harvard in the early days and then um, at North Carolina State University. Um, and it's similar to what, what we're describing here is those initiatives brought people together. They tried to bring people together um, for different disciplines to um, come, up, come up with uh, novel, you know, new approaches to doing things. Um, so a lot of those data science initiatives were almost like, um, um, you know, matchmaking <laughs> in a way, uh, trying to bring um, different groups together. Um, this, this is actually, um, and I highly recommend it, I gathered all these names from um, uh, reports that I received from, a newsletter that I received from uh, Laura Noren and, and uh, Brad Stanger, I think. Uh, it's called the Data Science Community Newsletter, and it's extremely invaluable um, resource. Uh, it saves time on actually going out and trying to find all these different news sources if you're interested in data science. Uh, so they, they cover it for you, and they... Uh, they find all these interesting stories and they cover in initiatives like these that are popping up in industry or in, uh, in academia. So the other thing too um, is a lot of this stuff runs on um, software, especially soft in infrastructure in a way. Like the, um, if you can think about it, that so uh, research runs on a, a lot of scripts. <laughs> a lot of different programs out there to do various things. Um, it's a network of all these tools that are developed um, by um, sometimes postdocs or graduate students or, um, you know, if they're lucky, they have a, a res research software engineer um, in, in teams and labs that develop the software. Um, and, and, you know, this was a survey that was done uh, by the Software Sustainability Institute, another resource I recommend. Um, that just highlighted the importance of research, um, but also it highlights the fact that there's sort of two things in this too, is that um, there's also a lack of training, and I, I kind of doubt this number because this was a uh, survey that was done of um, more experts in the community. So you think about it, like the, the people that are struggling to maintain these tools, I don't think they, they responded to the survey. So I think that that number is probably higher um, the other thing is there's a huge demand for credit for this work that 
um, people don't feel like they're getting the credit for the, the research software that they're developing. And, uh, and so um, I, I looked up the numbers, and uh, one of the primary uh, repositories that's used for um, citing, for getting credit in citing software is called Zenodo. Um, it's named after Zenodotus, the first uh, librarian of Alexandria. And um, you could see from 2014, late 2014 to present, there have been 60,000 uh, uh, deposits in Zenodo for software citations now, software credit. And, uh, you know, so that's just an amazing jump um, increase. Uh, so there's a huge demand. But um, also, so um, just to come back to that lack of training, this is a famous... <laughs> famous paper that went wrong, um, which um, basically the, 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 there was an error in Excel, in Excel sheet, they, they made an error. Um, I think they just dragged <laughs> a pivot ta table in the wrong direction and, uh, and, they, and, and they got <coughs> different GDP, GDP, GDP numbers, but based on this, this paper, people started making decisions and reporting on it. And, and that was just a slight mistake. <laughs> And so you imagine all these uh, slight mistakes that happen in research and, and uh, again, pointing back to that need for um, training to um, have better workflows, better you know, to do better data science and um, to be able to re reproduce your uh, research. Um, it's important. And um, besides the, the, that example, I wanted to show a good example. <laughs> Um, this is a group, the Ocean Health Index, um, that did pay attention to training and, and um, really dramatically changed their workflows to be more open, um, to share their research in a versioned way in, um, in a place like GitHub. And, uh, and, and you know, they, they talk about how that fundament, fundamentally changed things for them. And uh, they were no longer scrambling when someone asked a question. They could answer it very easily because they had all this work versioned and organized um, efficiently. So, um, so this is this kind of like an older uh, report, um, but I, I included it in here because um, uh, it's very similar to a report, uh, survey that um, we did when I was in astronomy at the Center for Astrophysics, highlighting again the importance of training. This one uh, is is a bioinformatics community in Australia. But um, the survey we did of 400 astronomers at the Center for Astrophysics was, was very similar. There was, at the top of their list of needs was, um, was training, um, that they didn't get it in their, in their curriculum when they're, when they're uh, you know, graduate student, as, as graduate students, they had to struggle to learn it as postdocs and uh, um, in their own time. And so this, this was just an overwhelming need um, when I was more embedded in the in astronomy community. Um, a later uh, report um, sort of highlights also delves down into what they mean by training and so you can see um, you know just uh, working with different data types data management metadata high performance computing uh, these top three that they're um, that um, the biology community this big data survey this NSF survey was uh, highlighted So, after all that, just going through, um, uh, giving you, I wanted to give you just a, 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 gl uh, a glance at what, uh, what you know, some of the things are happening in uh, these reports for data science in academia and industry, um, and um, maybe a possible way for us to, um, to respond to this. Um, to scale up and to respond to these needs. Um, so building, building a community that um, is more around sort of volunteers, this, this happens uh, anyways at institutions. You see it often, every, many places you go to, um, there's a, a desire in labs, um, in research labs or in departments um, oftentimes uh, by early career researchers um, that come in and see that there's this huge gap, there's no one talking about the skills that they need in these groups. Um, and um, 
And so that as volunteers, they try to, um, you know, train their communities that way. Uh, there's no real structure around it, though. Um, and, you know, lessons are, are, are kind of ad hoc and, uh, you know, like the, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit uh, less, orga less organized and, and not coordinated. And, uh, and so um, one thing that we do as the Carpentries uh, is provide that sort of organization for a volunteer-led community. Um, and we train, we train people in software development and data science skills. Um, uh, one of our other, other uh, aspects of, of uh, the Carpentries is that uh, we uh, value community. Um, so you remember in um, the report, the investing in um, uh, future talent, this PwC report I mentioned uh, earlier, um, is um, also we f feel like community al allows us to build a more diverse um, you know, group of uh, um, people that have data science skills and uh, to encourage um, you know, that diversity and inclusion. It's, it's in our mission, it's in our value, our, our, our vision, and um, we sort of live and breathe it. Uh, um, so um, I, also <laughs> I also wanted to point out here to, to note, because people ask, why carpentries? Um, and um, it, it really goes back to um, um, it, it, software. We started as Software Carpentry, um, named as Software Carpentry. And uh, it was uh, the early days, um, it was Greg Wilson who, who started Software Carpentry at um, um, Lawrence Livermore Labs, I think. Um, or it might have been another lab, I'm, I'm just blanking. But um, it happened even back in the 90s where Greg Wilson was seeing from physicists and other people that, that, that uh, they needed these skills. And so he um, started to develop this program. But it wasn't about, it wasn't like you see the programs you see in, um, in universities where it's a, a curriculum, a full curriculum. This is about practical skills that researchers needed. Um, and, you know, like things that they could use right away in their work to improve things. Um, uh, and, and so that's how we got the name Carpentry. Um, so um, our workshops, our two day active, learning um, workshops you can see in this, uh, is in this image. Um, there's a lot of hands-on work um, of, of learning how to do this uh, um, from basically just walking through um, our lessons and, and walking through a process. Um, people walk through, uh, you know, just various, uh, various things. And um, I think one thing that sets, uh, sets us apart is it's, it seems very simple, um, but it's, it's very effective. One thing that we do um, is do this um, active, this uh, feedback, um, active feedback during the, during the workshop. So I don't know if, yeah, you can see them. So you see these uh, post-it notes on the top of the laptops there? <laughs> um, we use two different colored post-it notes and um, they signal if you're having trouble or if you're doing well, and it's a signal to the to the to the instructor to, to slow down or speed up or you know like carry carry on or slow down, um, or for our helpers we also have helpers that come over and help the person as they're um, as they're learning. We also use those stickies to collect feedback after each uh, section of the lesson, and and so like we read those after each section and try to make some improvements, explain something that we, we missed. Um, so we're getting feedback at various points too. We also have feedback surveys at the beginning and surveys at the end um, that we use. Um, and uh, we, have a train, we have a training program for instructors, so they're certified. Um, and it, it takes, um, I think if you added up the time, maybe three, three four days, you know, become an instructor and it's more about the pedagogy um, and um, part of that pedagogy is about teaching in a, creating a friendly environment creating a, a welcoming environment <clears throat> so what do we what do we teach in, in these things um, in these workshops um, so um, 
you might have heard of the different carpentries, but so we have three at the moment. There's one that's not listed there. It's still experimental. It's called High Performance Computing Carpentry, HPC Carpentry. Um, but data carpentry is more domain specific, so we have lessons um, uh, for social sciences, for ecology. Um, there's even more and more lessons being developed um, by our community members. Uh, software carpentry was uh, where we originated, and uh, that started mainly around workflows. Um, so about how to improve your workflows, um, a lot of a versioning of command line work. Uh, library carpentry um, is, is also fairly new, um, and that, um, that's for, it, it started as library and information workflow related um, of onboarding library, librarians to the carpentry community, um, but we're finding more that, uh, more and more that libraries bring this other dimension to the carpentries that um, help with fostering community. Um, so, <laughs> um, as librarians, we value um, accessibility, we value diversity and inclusion, and uh, you know, it is it is part of being a library of creating a welcoming environment. Um, so it's uh, it's one of the things we bring to the table in, in the carpentries, um, and then. Um, uh, the other thing too is is is, uh, is experimentation and flexibility because libraries um, are all over the place in some ways. Um, software carpentry was more specific, and data carpentry can be more specific by through its lessons. Library carpentry, we have so many things that we're interested in, um, and so I think we we bring come, bring to the table that this experimentation. And so some of the new lessons that are being developed in library carpentry are around data privacy. Um, Wikidata is another one. Um, so, um, and I'm not sure they would necessarily be developed in the other carpentry. So, um, uh, this is, just shows you some of the um, the technologies that we um, that we we teach, and the, these are sort of the core technologies because it, it can. Like I said, library carpentry is sort of expanding and uh, doing much more, but um, software carpentry, command line version control, programming. Again, workflows, um, improving your workflows. Um, and then data carpentry uh, has all these domain specific um, uh, you know, examples. And uh, data carpentry really, again, it's just about um, how do I get, how, how can we train researchers to start improving the work that they're doing with their data with certain tools um, and uh, you know it's it's pretty it's pretty effective also when you you um, focus the training on a particular context so we've had librarians say that too that it's so helpful to have library and data that that we work with not with not with like ecology data <laughs> so it helps with the context to have um, particular data so, and we were talking about this earlier, um, um, but um, data wrangling is a big part of library carpentry, um, working with metadata. Um, so, <clears throat> our workshop goals, um, this is no-brainer, teach skills, <laughs> uh, give people a starting point. I think um, that helps people considerably just to know because um, it is intense. It is intense to learn all these things in two days. Um, but um, I, I think often uh, I'd say that we come away, people come away from these uh, workshops um, at least feeling like they know where to start and they know where to search for things. Um, and they have that confidence um, that allows them to push forward and, and continue learning. Um, and again, we try to encourage this positive learning experience. So um, any any question, any question you have is is welcome. So um, so we, we it's amazing to see uh, <coughs> some of these uh, some of the um, the participants, some of the new instructors come into our lists or um, Slack or other things and start asking questions and feeling empowered. Um, so what is the scale of all this? <laughs> Um, 
this is an old number. <laughs> I, it's hard to keep up, but we are, um, we are growing so much. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's unbelievable um, that um, I think these are, I, I think now we have closer to like 70 or 80 trainers. Um, um, we definitely have more learners over 40,000 now. Um, but um, these workshops um, and the, the instructors, they're worldwide. Um, you can see they're in 44 countries. Um, we, um, we don't have the presence that we'd like in, in, uh, in places like China or Japan, but like the interest is growing there. Um, and India is another one, which we should have a, pre pre a, pre a presence there. Um, South America, I wish we had uh, a little bit more presence. Um, but I think the one we're very proud of is that um, Carpentries is exploding in Africa. Um, and one of the leading countries um, in the top 10 is Ethiopia, um, of, of uh, early adopters and starting to, to teach. Um, South, you can see South Africa was one of, was basically, they were, you can see all the dots in South Africa. That was one of the uh, originators of Carpentries in Africa. Um, and then Antarctica, we actually had um, a story in nature from um, one of, one of uh, Carpentry's instructors. Uh, she was able to stay longer for her research. I guess the uh, flight was uh, delayed, and she stayed <coughs> an extra days, and she ran a Carpentry's workshop in, uh, the, uh, in one of the stations down there. And so they wrote up an article in Nature about that. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, so who's taking these workshops? This, this is a, a as I, I told you, we do a lot of surveys. And so we, we, we know a pretty good amount of information. We, ha we know a pretty good deal uh, about our community. And, uh, and uh, you can probably see that uh, the group that kind of stands out as graduate students, um, but postdocs and undergraduates, um, it's, it it's comes to about roughly 66% of the um, of, of our uh, community, but I think that other is actually more early career researchers, so that, that number should be probably higher as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, so a, a lot of our workshops um, um, have this community in them. Um, this is something you hear often in libraries, is that um, um, many of the people, ma many of the, the uh, attendees of our workshops are actually coming from early career researchers. And, and so this, this, the training really speaks to, seems to speak, speak to this community. And they, they come to it either, either thinking that, you know, oh, I'll need these skills if, um, if uh, I go to industry, um, or it'll be valuable wherever I go if I'm a postdoc. Um, and so the, it, it seems like a, 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 you know, something that can help with their, their career path. And um, we see it more and more people listing this on their um, resume, CVs as well, um, their certification. And we actually see people asking for someone with Carpentry's experience uh, in job ads, too. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so um, the instructor, how do you become an instructor? Um, what's involved in becoming an instructor? Um, a anyone can. Um, it's open. Um, and you can apply um, to become an instructor online. Uh, the wait is long. Um, it, it generally takes about um, eight, seven, eight months maybe, um, and that's the free. That's the free <laughs> version. <laughs> um, the other version is that you can become a member as an institution, and um, and when you become a member, you have a certain amount of um, slots that you can um, that you have to do online instructor training as a, a um, as a cohort which is sometimes better to have people you can, you, know, so you can work with. So as an example, when I was at North Carolina State University, we partnered with the graduate school. Um, the graduate school was very keen on doing this um, because um, they had these uh, 
summer events where they would host the industry partners to come in and talk to graduate students and, and uh, you know postdocs and um, and oftentimes in those events they would hear about these skills um, you know that that the, the businesses industry are looking for these things so when I first uh, approached the graduate school I think I got one minute into my presentation they said we're doing it <laughs> and we don't really have to see the rest of the presentation because we know that this is invaluable to our community. And sure enough, too, when they announced it to the graduate community, to the graduate student community, we had a number of students uh, uh, step up to say they would love to be instructors. Um, and so we did it as a partnership, so three librarians and three, um, three graduate students <laughs> um, did that training together. And it, it was a great experience, I think. It was a, it was a real partnership. Um, and it, I think it's going to be an ongoing partnership between the library and the graduate uh, school. It should be other departments on campus. Um, it really ranges. Like, we see variation in how people partner with these memberships or how they um, approach um, carpentry. So Duke has been one of the, they, in fact, uh, data carpentry almost began at Duke. And they're not members, um, but there's, um, there was a contingent of people developing lessons in their bioinformatics community, and uh, and only recently they became members. But the library has been trying to become members for a long time. So, they, so there, there's been in some cases there's disconnect. You know, like some places, uh, IT they try to work with IT and uh, um, and uh, it doesn't happen. And so, in other places, IT is a huge supporter of this. Um, and, you know, in the case of high performance computing, that becomes very important to to the IT uh, community. So it, it really is different how these things, uh, um, it's very organic. <laughs> and I think that that's kind of like our mantra in carpentries is we're organic, we're, um, we're flexible, we're, you know, it's more about community, it's community volunteers. Um, so um, it's anyone who is passionate about this and wants to uh, help others. Uh, so the process though is, uh, um, it's very different than probably what you think it is. Um, we don't teach you how to use like GitHub. We don't teach you how to use like R, R Studio, or like how to do programming in Python. We teach you about teaching, about pedagogy, um, and so it's all those things that I told you about uh, before about um, you know how to create that welcoming environment, how to um, pace your um, your teaching. Um, what not what to say, what not to say, um, and um, about philosophy, about um, you know how to organize your teaching. Uh, so um, it's very it's it's uh, I've done it myself. I'm an instructor. Um, I was skeptical at first, <laughs> but it is very it is very helpful. And I think um, what's even more invaluable is once you finish, then you, you're you have all these other community members to talk to and so um, you know you can you can come back to them and ask them questions and talk about and like and I would be, I, I myself will be doing this because I did a teaching I did a workshop recently and I'll go back to some of my colleagues and ask them you know how could I have done this better um, so it's really it's really uh, helpful to have other people you can reach out to but after you do so you do this two-day online training it's mostly online we do some in-person trainings, uh, and, and these are for instructors. Um, we, we do most of them online, um, and uh, the, there's sort of three steps after that. Once you finish your online training, um, teaching you how to do the pedagogy, um, you have like three, step, three checks that you have to do, which is uh, edit a lesson. Um, it can be very small, um, but it's to get you familiar with your with uh, contributing to our lessons. So one thing that op happens often is after you teach, you find errors, you find things that need to change in the, the lesson. And so um, you go back and you change something to fix a link, maybe something as simple as that, or you change language. Um, and uh, the other thing that happens too is uh, um, you have a one hour discussion with people that just ran a workshop, that taught a workshop, to hear what they encountered, so you, you, know, you, you get that early exposure. 
and then you do a demo, you do a five minute demo of your teaching. Um, uh, and you know, we have one of our trainers there just to um, provide feedback to you as well. And uh, So after that though, you, you uh, um, I mentioned that we don't teach you the tools necessarily, how you, how you become, eventually become um, uh, a full-fledged instructor is you start small, you start with a, just a, you start with a lesson, uh, one lesson in a workshop, or you, you start as a helper, or you host something and you build your way up. So you learn the, the tools that way by um, gradually um, doing workshops. Or some people come into it with those skills already, so they're already familiar with these tools. Um, but, um, I mentioned collaborative lesson development. Uh, so all of our lessons are on GitHub, um, and uh, any, anyone can tr contrib contribute to them. So you don't have to be a member, or, you, know, you, you, can, you don't have to be a member of the community. You can, uh, be someone that just is using the, the lessons in your uh, in your own work, and you can find something and and contribute to it that way. Um, for me, in libraries, this is a game changer, <laughs> and it may not seem like much, but um, in libraries we develop guides that end up being very static, and uh, you know, like they end up being only used by maybe a few people, and. Uh, um, this collaborative lesson development is, is eye-opening for me because it, it, it opens up something that we as librarians could potentially work with other, uh, other members of our community or other librarians. And because uh, we, often, we often do duplicate our, 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 our work. So if you looked for guides from all the different universities on physics or chemistry, you'd find a lot of the same thing. <laughs> Over and over again from each uh, from from each library, and uh, wouldn't it be great if we could work together <laughs> in a way like this? So I think it's a game changer. Um, and in fact, I'm working on a lesson on uh, something that's coming up um, called FAIR, which is uh, and it's an acronym called for find findability, um, accessibility, uh, interoperability, and reusability, and um, Really, bottom line is uh, this fair is to help with your research, making it um, more discoverable, helping with reproducibility, help with linking it to other research. And so uh, that is becoming more and more uh, prevalent in Europe, and it's probably coming our way. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, but I'm developing a lesson to help when um, with other people to help researchers in, in, in other places when that starts hitting as a requirement. Um, and so we'll have material available to help people. <clears throat> um, I, I mentioned this a little bit, to, so I, I mentioned this before, but there are many ways you can, um, you can reach out to the community and get help. Um, so there's mentoring programs that we have, discussion groups, the, lists. We have a Slack channel. It's very useful. You get answers almost right away. Um, and uh, we're all over the place. We're at so many other institutions uh, now. So we've had uh, these lessons um, in many places. And uh, these are just some of the quotes that we've received from, um, from people, but um, it, it goes on and on. Uh, we've gotten a lot of great feedback about um, how this has helped, um, a, to a large extent, researchers um, with, uh, with their workflows, with uh, working with data. And, um, so I just thought I'd share with you some. And then I mentioned our surveys. Um, how effective is this? I think one of the interesting things is confidence, that people feel uh, confident, um, more confident, and after they, um, you know, after they attend one of these workshops, but you can see all these other things like reproducibility, they feel, you know, that they've improved, um, you know, it'd be great if that was all the way at the end here, <laughs> uh, um, higher percentage at, uh, of, um, of strongly agree, um, and I think that, that's something we're, we're still working on is like how do we, help learners after these workshops? How do we 
help people. Um, so yesterday, um, we had a discussion about that, of how to create community after training so that people can continue to, to work on um, these types of things. And uh, it, uh, it often ends up being a difficult thing because um, people want to, people want to be, they, they want, uh, proximity is very close, or very important to people. Like um, if, you, if you're trying to create a broader community where someone lives in Baltimore, and to see it's going to be very hard for people to come together and uh, continue this stuff. So, um, so um, carpentry, 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 <laughs> data carpentry, software carpentry, HPC carpentry. We've done. Uh, we've hurt ourselves in a way um, because um, I mentioned these are things. These are more organic. These are organic programs. Um, they start out from community members. Um, and so that's how library carpentry started. That's how data carpentry started. And, and we started the branding, the branding um, because it was all based off the of software carpentry. Um, the reality is we're all one carpentry now. <laughs> so when you hear someone say, you know, I'm doing data carpentry, I'm doing software carpentry, it's, they're doing carpentry. It's, it's, uh, we're slowly but surely coming together as um, one brand, one, uh, one community. Um, and, and so I've been involved in that process of, try, of bringing library carpentry into that umbrella. Um, and what that means is um, you have researchers that can teach library carpentry, you can have librarians teaching um, e ecology lessons, you know, vice versa, it's a seamless community, all these lessons. If you become a certified instructor, you can do it all. Um, and, um, it takes time. I mean, it's, it's not like that, that is simple, but it takes time. But you can traverse throughout all these different uh, um, lessons, uh, and there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, in the library uh, context, um, there was this nice example of uh, a project in Australia called 23 Research Data Things, and um, it was a way for them to... Um, Help their help librarians get to a certain point where they understood um, what what was needed um, in in research services. Um, there's a lot of a lot of uh, people were were um, asking for this, but there weren't you know these opportunities that started off at a more basic level. And so, um, I, ANS, the Australian National Data Service, uh, um, ran this program, and like thousands of librarians. Um, attended it and afterwards they felt like they were more comfortable talking about data with their researchers, with each other. Um, it was an amazing program. Um, I talked to some of these people, some of the librarians after it, and uh, um, you know they, they had nothing but uh, good things to say about it. And I think library carpentry is very similar to that of, of um, onboarding librarians um, so that we can help um, we can we can um, get up to the next level to, to work as a team uh, to um, help with data services in our communities because um, you can't just have one data librarian <laughs> that that one data data librarian for a university just think about that that's ridiculous uh, you need a team you need you it, and it's not just a library it's everyone <laughs> so there are cases like this. Um, so some places that have adopted the carpentries um, much faster, um, Oklahoma, um, University of Oklahoma, um, ha has, I think, over uh, 100 instructors now. And um, the, the core of that is through the library, so the library organizes that, but it's seamless. It's researchers and librarians providing uh, these, these uh, services, these skills to, to so like, a librarian could go with a researcher and teach in a, um, in a classroom and prepare students for a, a class um, that's heavy on data analysis. Um, or, you know, <laughs> researchers can come and teach a library carpentry to the librarians. Um, so it's very seamless. Um, uh, it's, it's a new approach. <laughs> so it, it's interesting because we, we're not part of the institution. Um, we're, we're sort of this outside, this, this uh, um, uh, organic entity that's in institutions. Uh, so, 
Um, like I said, the, it can't be just one data librarian. There's, it's, it's all of us uh, in different ways. Um, and I mentioned that uh, um, one of the important things about um, uh, the carpentries is community, but again, I think the li library side of things is uh, important for fostering that community, creating a place um, where people can come and talk about these things. So here are some examples. So um, what happens when um, you go to your institution, to your uh, to library administration, and say, um, from what they are right now to something that's more shared and uh, that others can contribute to. And, um, it's really interesting trying to convert um, PowerPoint lessons <laughs> into a lesson in the conference. It's, it's, it's amazing to understand how much is lost in these slides. And uh, so I, I also think the, the, the process of developing a lesson is, is uh, it provides more context, more, more information for people. It's a, it's a better resource. Um, you know, because sli slides are all over the, the web, and if you need information about something, you have to dig through these slides. And uh, I think what we, what we developed in the carpentries is more accessible. It has examples with the exercises. You know, it, you can dive right in. Um, so the other example, too, is the National Library of Medicine, which is right around the corner. Uh, not, well, not that close, but it's in the area. And... Um, uh, they ran two library carpentry workshops, um, and they did see improvements. They had a number of people in, in their community um, come back to the second training. They've done two trainings. They've come back to uh, tell their stories about how they've improved their, um, their workflows. They're, you know, again, wrangling with data, automating their workflows, a lot of those kind of stories. And then they've also said, well, we want to do all these other things now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we've appreciated these lessons, but we need, um, we need more. Um, and um, you can see some of these lessons are actually some of the things we teach. Like Open Refine is a wrangling tool, really helpful if you, if you, you want to sort of have a step up before you do programming. Open Refine is uh, like Excel on steroids. And uh, it's, a, it's a really helpful tool as that sort of in-between point. Um, and you can see some other other ideas here. Uh, we just taught Python to the Library of Congress, um, and it went really well, <laughs> which is, it's, it's very hard, you know, it's a hard, hard transition um, when you're using tools to go to programming, um, which is very much more abstract and thinking about how you approach things. Um, I'm in the uh, RTP area, the, the Raleigh Triangle, um, uh, the Research Triangle uh, with Raleigh and Durham and, uh, and uh, Chapel Hill. And so there are three big universities there. Uh, one of them, Chapel, uh, UNC Chapel Hill, um, the university librarian um, there, Elaine Westbrooks, wrote this great blog story on the strategic, strategic value of the carpentries. And so one of the things that she wants to do um, what we're going to do, actually, next month, is we're going to train um, 30 librarians. Um, and, and it's a special workshop where so they attend the workshop, and then, um, and then they are fast-tracked to becoming instructors. And one of the things she wants to do is get her staff trained um, for them to be a hub so that when they become members, they can offer all the instructor training to uh, graduate students, postdocs, and so they're, they're already um, set as, as uh, instructors and they can start. Um, it, it sounds like a great idea that when you launch something, you offer it up to, <laughs> to, uh, to all the research, researchers in the community and they create that, start creating that connection and, um, <clears throat> and also demonstrating that the library is a hub, a great hub for these activities. Um, so, um, so again, what, what I said before, um, the library can help in those cases where you have all those labs trying to reinvent the wheel and trying to do training. You know, like when a postdoc leaves, it's a gap, and then other people have to sort of fill that void and do the training again. 
well, the library is going to be here. <laughs> it's going to be, you know, a great hub for those kind of things where people come in and say, where do I get these training? You know, the, li oh, the library runs this program. Um, and, but it's not just the library. It's, it's everyone else as part of it. So um, I mentioned this FAIR data and software. Um, and this is something that Tib Hanover, this uh, the library um, in, in Hanover, uh, they ran um, Carpentry's uh, workshop, but they paired it with something else. So it's really, it's really interesting to see how you can use sort of Carpentry's work to foster some other things that you want to do. Um, so they incorporated lessons, they you know, mixed and matched. Uh, and, and did uh, a week-long summer program um, which prepared their researchers for FAIR. Like, like I mentioned before, in Europe this is even more important to uh, FAIR um, and so a lot of, a lot of them are, are hearing that they need to do it. And so the library was prepared. It actually was interesting because that, that it was run by the library but, but the instructors were all researchers. So. <laughs> Um, they were researchers that worked in the library too, um, but yeah, it was it was an amazing program. It, it, it showed that um, the flexibility of the lessons, um, and I guess this is an important uh, point to make too, is that um, in order for us to do the counting, the statistics that we do, we try to structure what is a workshop, and so something like this is 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 something we're trying to deal with is how how are these counted. How are all the you know experimentation um, experimentations? We want that to happen. I want that to especially happen in library carpentry. Uh, but so we're trying to figure out how we how we count these kind of things and uh, do the survey data and other things like that. Um, so um, this is just a glance of what is available in library carpentry right now. Um, these are these are things that researchers also want to learn. <laughs> so we have. We have, you know, even though this is this is from the library context, we ha have researchers wanting to take library carpentry too, and vice versa. We have librarians that want to take all the other lessons. So, um, but this is more text-based, right? Um, so, um, you have web scraping, um, you have the Git intro. It's more, um, it's more about working with text, um, and that and that is mainly the the data that we use for these. Um, so, if, for instance, Unix shell. The command line is uh, is something um, most of the lesson is around how to search for keywords, so how to search for terms and, and um, like thousands of files, you know, like how to develop programs to automate that process, and uh, and then of course Open Refine is uh, is uh, is a great tool for cleaning your data, um, and it's actually used by researchers too in some of the um, training programs that they use. In fact, when I did my training, I told researchers about Open Refine, <laughs> and they were very interested. Um, I was trying to teach, I was trying to do my demo, and they kept stopping me and saying, what, what, what did you do? <laughs> so they, they, they had never heard about Open Refine, and they were very interested. Um, so, um, but yeah, we're, like, as I said, we're, um, there's a fly up here. Um, there's, there's more development happening, um, and uh, I mentioned digital humanities, data privacy, Wikidata. Um, there's one on R that someone wants to do, so we're expanding. Um, one of the questions I get is, uh, how can I get started? Um, and uh, you can be a host. <coughs> you can reach out to us and say, I'd like to host a workshop. Um, generally, um, that means that you have to make a commitment maybe to, um, to uh, you know, paying for travel. Um, it depends if you have local instructors nearby, which is happening in DC. There's more and more instructors. Then the costs go down, you know, of course, because travel is, is uh, minimal. Um, but that, those are sort of the, there's some costs involved in that. Um, if you have local instructors, then there's no cost. <laughs> but um, you can also help too, so you can, um, you can if you are interested and you, um, you're familiar with something like Git or, um, or uh, you know, Open Refine, then you can reach out and say, I would like to be a helper. And you can, um, you know, as you saw in that picture, 
you can float around, and if someone has a red sticky up, you can help them with the, with what our challenge. And, but it allows you as a helper to sit to stand back sometimes and see how the teaching is done, um, and and get that initial exposure. Um, I highly recommend that to s either start as a as a helper or as a host. Um, and then there's the teach. You can just dive right in, <laughs> and so you can become you can become a member or you can. Uh, Register to become an instructor and uh, dive right in. Uh, but I think it's good to start off slowly and uh, and then build your your way up. Uh, so, oh, by the way, in the background there, that the, the whiteboard is a thing we uh, one of the um, one of the sessions is called jargon busting, and so um, we talk about all the things that we heard that we don't understand, like. <laughs> What what is an API, and then so we talk about what that what that is, and try to connect it, link it to other parts of the lesson that we're going to teach, provide some context. Um, this is a great, uh, just a great chart of um, the different membership options available to you. There is some uh, some flexibility on your membership, but depending like. What in kind kind of things you want to do, but this is this is pretty standard now, um, and most people go in at the silver level. Um, they start off at like a pilot level, and they do six and in, six instructors. They train six instructors, um, but um, the platinum is no, no prices listed because <laughs> it is very flexible. But that's what University of Oklahoma is at actually is platinum. Um, so they've dot dived into this, so uh, they're, they're like fully in, so it's amazing to see what they've, what they've done. Um, so another thing too is, uh, um, recently I, I was involved with a number of people um, uh, to put together this report. We gathered um, people from industry, from libraries, um, you know, uh, for, again, across the spectrum of understanding how can we shift to being data savvy in libraries, how can we, um, you know, how can we um, support data science? And um, in that report, um, it was just a riddle. It was, it was the, there were so many mentions of, of carpentries as uh, a step forward for us. Um, it was, it was pretty apparent that this was one thing that, that um, you know, that, that we could do um, to start supporting these activities on campus. And I go back to that Sloan Moore um, uh, report that I mentioned before. Um, that also comes up high, highly in that report as well, is that uh, a lot of the members in that community were, um, became Carpentries members and, um, and, and, you know, they became instructors and that's how they facilitated that environment, how they made it more welcoming to have these conversations. And, uh, so, um, but yeah, so we have an upcoming um, library carpentry workshop at George Mason, and actually American University is a, a part of that um, consortium. Uh, and so maybe some librarians from, from American University can go to that, but that's Another one of these workshops that will allow librarians to go and, uh, and, and get training more quickly um, as for a fast track, fast track option. Um, and uh, yeah, otherwise, that's, uh, that's it. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs> yeah? Uh, so I work a lot with non-academic communities. Do you do trainings for non-academic communities such as city managers, press groups, neighborhood groups? Well, yeah, see, journalists. that that's one of the conversations that we're having right now. So, um, um, so a librarian reached out to us um, from Chicago and said, uh, really want to have a workshop here. Um, and I asked them who would be interested in, be, in hosting. Um, and she mentioned that there was a civic tech group that uh, that met every every month and um, it just so happened that Microsoft was a big sponsor of that group the civic tech group 
So we're talking about running a workshop at Microsoft for the civic tech community um, and, and for public libraries. Um, but um, yeah, that, that conversation is happening in other places now. So we do trainings for um, places like um, um, you know, biosciences, in the biosciences industry, we, we start doing um, trainings. Uh, uh, just trying to think of some of the, the names. Uh, uh, one, Monsanto, actually. <laughs> we do trainings for, for Monsanto. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's an area that we're interested in doing something. We, we definitely want to expand past um, academic institutions. Um, at the moment, our, our content is, it comes from that area. But so, recently, we also, we also did a training for, um, for librarians um, at Calgary become instructors, and there was a, um, a librarian from uh, Lebanon Public Library, and um, he particularly was interested in developing the lessons for public libraries, again, around civic tech, um, and he thought some of the elements in our lessons were already there that he could use, and they just needed to be adapted. In some ways, like we said, like, like I said before, is that uh, um, it matters to think about the data at, at the local context, like what it means to that um, particular community. So, um, yeah, we need to understand um, and have people involved from that community to help with like developing lessons. And, but the, the desire is there. <laughs> it, it, and again, it, it really comes from passionate people, the volunteers, the people that um, want, you know, want, want to build something up as part, as part of the community. Um, it starts there. So. so if I could just do one follow-up. In Africa, for instance, and Ethiopia <clears throat> and some of the other um, countries, who are the people who are taking these workshops? Are they all academics? A large portion of them are, yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> I think, again, there, there are these links between, um, the, bet between, the re be between research and government in those cases, too. Um, so in, in our... We do have links to government, uh, you know, like, uh, so the federal, tr the treasury actually has run software, uh, software, software carpentry uh, trainings. Uh, there's a, no, uh, here in the U.S., yeah. So, the tr yeah, treasury has done it, um, and they have instructors uh, there. So, um, I've recently, I've been getting more and more requests from um, government librarians, yeah. And it may come up where they say, well, we need different data, we need different context, uh, and we'll just have to work on that. <laughs> and they have to help us. <laughs> but um, I think that's what, that's what usually the path that happens is you, you take the training, you become an instructor, and then you start thinking about how you can um, um, you know, work with the material to um, adapt it to a particular context. And then other people become interested in it, and they start... Um, it starts gathering. You know, there's, there's a gathering that happens, and so um, that there's one case like museums is one place where that conversation is happening too. Like, well, how do we do this in museums? And, um, and, and oh, one more thing too. Like, there's a little bit of nervousness too about like museum carpentry. <laughs> you know, like just going crazy with the carpentry. We've got to do something about the branding because that confuses people. Um, and so that, that, that was discussed at our last annual conference. So, yeah, you have a question. Are you aware um, of the NIH's presence in the carpentries community? Do they have? Yeah, uh, at the Library of Congress uh, um, tra training that we just did yesterday, there was someone from there uh, helping. Okay. And he, he's, he's going through the training program. Um, and he's starting off as a helper just to get him. They, they weren't aware, when they did their library carpentry, they weren't aware that they were going rogue a little bit. <laughs> so they just did it. They took the lesson materials and they just did it. Um, and you, you, you need to have a certified instructor there. Um, but they read all the material and they, they familiarized themselves with it. So like I said, it's all free. You can, mm -hmm. you can use it already anyways. You, you had a question, right? You mentioned uh, diversity and inclusion being a central part of your mission, and you talked about building communities a lot. 
Um, can you tell me more about some of the ways that you have specifically tried to increase diversity in the in the outreach and maybe for members of underrepresented communities, why would they choose to learn from the carpentries as opposed to other options into entering um, into doing more data science or is it yeah, I, I'm, I myself, I'm on the, we have a, a team uh, for diversity and uh, inclusion in the carpentries, uh, and um, we're, uh, we're developing that strategy, um, particularly my strategy is I'm, I'm working with um, uh, HBCUs, uh, historically black colleges and universities to try and work through the libraries to help um, build up community there. Um, but I know that we've reached out to societies, um, groups that um, are in, you know, uh, different areas. Uh, so um, another aspect is the code of conduct. Um, so we've developed a code of conduct that is also freely available. And so every time we teach, um, in fact, I use it in my lessons. Like yesterday, we did text mining on the code of conduct, <laughs> which is uh, someone came up to me afterwards. Um, and so that was that was great that we used that as you know like allowed me to read through it some more and uh, but um, every every uh, every workshop we we start with that we emphasize the code of conduct and we actually um, we uh, we actually have a committee too that um, instructors can report to and that um, we learn from and um, we try our best to respond to um, because we're also working at institutions that have different policies and. It's, it's a little bit challenging. Um, and we purposely, um, you know, we purposely try to reach out and, and include other people. You know, like that's, uh, that's just woven into our mission. So um, uh, I can think of a specific example. Um, when I was trying to develop the, um, uh, our governance group, or sorry, our curriculum advisory committee um, for library carpentry, um, all the suggestions I, I got were men. <laughs> and so I purposely uh, um, reached out um, to, you know, to, to others, to women, and, uh, and we have um, more women on the, uh, on the committee than men. So I, I myself felt it was, it was important uh, to have that kind of representation to, um, you know, again, to, to help people feel like they're, they're more welcome. I think in general, um, that's a mission of mine um, uh, we have some challenges in libraries, and I'm sure it's not just us, but um, we're predominantly, uh, I think, like 67, 70% of the population in libraries is, is composed of, of women, right? And, um, and so then you see a lot of the leadership, you know, I think it's skewed, and, and you see more men in leadership positions. Um, and so I, I feel like library carpentry can be that opportunity because I think uh, administration to management can hold people back. And so one of the things I want to do is develop a pool of money um, that can enable um, librarians when they come across these challenges and give them a chance to go and speak or, you know, like do a workshop somewhere, you know, just to give them an opportunity and the committee, again, will represent those values and, and hear something like that. And, um, but we, you know that that's just a slice of it's 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 really it's built into everything. Um, it, I could keep going, <laughs> and I think if you went to so we have an annual conference which I didn't list, um, which is um, called Carpentry Con, and if you go to a Carpentry Con, um, in fact our videos are up there. Like the ver very first keynote of Carpentry Con was about this subject about how to build a more inclusive community, and. Uh, I mean, it's just woven throughout all of our workshops and, and meetings that we had at that. Um, I, think it, I think, in fact, we had, like, workshops on it, how to do, more, you know, do better at it. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for this. Um, I'm actually from Georgetown, so it's not from AU. Um, and you mentioned that you, you didn't think, like, one data library skills, so there's one person doing data wrangling, and one person doing data biz, etc. Um, but I think like, the problem with that is that 
the community doesn't really necessarily know who to go to. So we've really been focused on trying to you know, fund the data librarian position. So could you talk a little bit more about why you said that you didn't really think that? Was well, that critical? you could have many data librarians. You can, I, you know, at the end of the day, we're all librarians, you know. <laughs> I've never been a title person, really, uh, but um, the, uh, yeah, I think, so I've had a lot of exposure. Before I, I, um, I joined Library and Carpentry, I, um, uh, I started a program called Data Scientist Training for Librarians, and a lot of the people that first initially came to that were data librarians, and they expressed a lot of frustration about administration hiring a data library and expecting them to do everything, you know, like, um, and that's not possible, it's just not possible. So that's what I worry about. Um, if you've got people doing different, different things, then that's what it should be like. But you need branding, you need purpose to, you know, people to come to you as a collective um, for you to think, think about how you approach that. And, I, I think carpentries is one option, you know, like it's one option of branding, of what, one option to, um, to help people understand that it's, it's a community, it's not just one, one person. Um, it's not the only option, you know, but it, it's, a, it's, it's one of the options out there. And, uh, um, but yeah, I, I think I'm specifically speaking to the fact that I, 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 I hope that libraries are moving on from thinking that one person can, can uh, can solve all these challenges, um, and um, and then it, you know another thing too is to think more organically about these things. We often, um, I mean, traditionally it was like the stacks, and you put a book, you know, in, in this place, and we think some ways we kind of think that way about data, and it's more fluid and uh, it's more organic, and um, it's something new to us, you know. And so that that's so you have a lot of libraries have developed a repository. And the repository sort of runs their services, and it's like, come and put your data here, and that's our service. And uh, but I think more and more libraries are starting to sense that it's all this other stuff. That um, and and the way to, to really go about it is to to be in the process, in the workflow, to work with people, to give them that that knowledge, that experience, to that depositing data or doing, it's nothing, you know, like, and it doesn't matter exactly where it is, you know, like, um, because I think some institutions have, have really <laughs> tried to force their researchers to put their information in a certain spot, and, uh, and there's all sorts of places where you can put your information. <laughs> um, as long as it's connected and that, that FAIR um, thing that I talked about before is, is a way to help with that, too, is, is, is to help as long as you're connecting it to the to help with discovery, then um, you know you're doing a good job. <laughs> but yeah, it was. I think there was one more question, right? Did you have a question? Or, I thought I saw. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to follow up on the comment about NIH. Um, I mean, I did attend some of those carpentry workshops, so I didn't know they were going rogue. <laughs> well, you eventually start to certify instructors? Was that through you guys, or...? No, so that, it was Mike, uh, um, oh, forgetting his last name, but um, he, he came up to me halfway through the lesson, and he said, I didn't know we went rogue. Because <laughs> I was telling him about how you had to be certified, and he's like, I, I didn't know that we, we did. <clears throat> and, and uh, I mean, that's the thing with open material. <laughs> yeah, right. So... Um, and I told him, it's all right, it's all right, you know, like, that you did that. Um, you're becoming a member now. I mean, that's just the path that you chose. And I think that's what people have a hard time with, is understanding your path. Um, because you go to our website, and it's like, what is that? And it's hard to, like, express community in a website. And so we've had discussions about how do we, exp how do we express that we have this great community of people. And it's, uh, it's, it's a diff difficult thing to convey. Uh, and Mike's the one you saw at the Library of Congress. Right? Yeah, Mike went to the, yeah, uh, Mike, uh, Dave, Dave, yeah, I, I, I'm forgetting his last name, but he, he, yeah, he taught, or he helped at the Library of Congress uh, yesterday and the day before that, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, um, I hope that, and so the National Library of Medicine is going through a process of rethinking um, 
I think exactly this, of how they um, help their research into data science and other things. And um, so I think this will come on more. You know, Mike is trying to be a part of that, but. Um, Mike Perlin? No. <laughs> I'm going to kill you. I'll, I'll find out. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I, they do have instructors over there, too, already. And our, in fact, I think you, yeah, I think today there is a, a workshop happening, and my, and the executive director of, of Carpentries is there for, with the NIH, thinking about how we work with um, them, so, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Questions. Thank you very much, Chris, for a, ter a terrific presentation. You've given us a lot of great ideas, particularly how the library can support the uh, sort of data driven research that's happening here at AU. Um, we welcome everybody to have some lunch, and Chris, you'll be around for, for a little bit longer to talk to anybody, take any additional questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>